Good afternoon and welcome to the Boise Metro Chamber Legislative Update Series. I'm Sarah Betweiser, your host for today's event. The Boise Metro Chamber is Idaho's only five-star accredited chamber and represents more than 1,900 businesses. We are only able to provide current events and educational content because of our members and their investment in our community. Today's event is sponsored by Optum. We are so grateful for their partnership and the work that they do for our community. There are so many beautiful places in rural Idaho, but living in these lower populated areas can sometimes mean limited access to mental health resources. To help, Optum and Hello Idaho are now offering free mental health first aid training for adults. Trained community members can be a potential lifeline for many struggling with mental health or substance use issues. To learn more about this free training, visit OptumIdaho.com. We would also like to give a big thanks to our media sponsors, Idaho Capital Sun and Idaho Ed News. For today's legislative update, we are joined by Superintendent Debbie Critchfield, uh, hopefully House Majority Leader, Leader Megan Blanksma, and Director Wendy Seacrest of the Workforce Development Council. We are hoping that Representative Blanksma will be able to join us, but she is currently sponsoring a bill up on the House floor and as the majority leader also needs to be there to manage the calendar. So we're hopeful that she'll be able to tune in, but uh, we're gonna go ahead and proceed with uh, our, our program for today. Moving to introductions, Superintendent Debbie Critchfield was elected Superintendent of Public Instruction in November of 2022 and was sworn in on January 2nd, 2023. Previously, she served as a seven year member of the Idaho State Board of Education and was president during her final two years. Debbie was co-chair to Governor Little's Education Task Force in 2019 and committee chair for Governor Otter's Higher Education Task Force in 2017. Debbie was an elected school board member in Kaja County for 10 years, five as board chair, and was on the executive committee of the Idaho School Boards Association. She worked as the public information officer for Kaja School District for nine years uh, stepping down before her election as state superintendent. Debbie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Representative Blanksma in hopes that she will be able to join us. Representative Blanksma is the majority leader of the House. She attended the University of Idaho and received her bachelor's in economics. She's serving in her third term in the House and sits on numerous committees, including health and welfare, resources and conservation, transportation, and ways and means. Director Wendy Seacrest was appointed Executive Director of the Workforce Development Council in 2017 by Governor Otter. She has worked in the private sector for state and local governments, nonprofits, and education. When her children ask what she does for a living, she sums it up as she helps Idahoans get good jobs. <laughs> Wendy, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So before we begin, I wanted to do a soft check-in. From your perspective, we entered this legislative, legislative session with the highest turnover uh, of any uh, that I can remember, a nearly 50% turnover within the legislature. How has that significant turnover impacted this session from your vantage point? Uh, Debbie, let's start with you. I think it, it's been um, an opportunity to, to get to know new people. Um, my approach this session, I don't know that it's been different this year so much as uh, just really emphasizing finding folks that have shared interests. I think that that's you know, the, the, always the goal to go find those who are interested in the same things that you are, whether you've worked with them um, you know, for a couple of years or, or not at all, as you pointed out, Sarah, that it, it was an unusually high uh, turnover, um, but uh, getting to know people and, and what's important in their communities uh, was, was a, a real goal and a, a priority for me. Wonderful. Wendy, how about you? You know, it, it, again, a real opportunity to uh, get to know and develop relationships with new individuals. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in getting all sorts of feedback and input into making the, the, the things that government does better. So, you know, the more people we can talk to, the more uh, 
you know, diversity of thought and, and opinions, um, you know, the better programs that we deliver. So um, it's been really nice getting to know some of the new legislators and, and understanding, you know, their perspectives, their backgrounds, um, and how all of that can help um, make what the Workforce Development Council does uh, even better. So it, it's been a change for sure, you know, and, and uh, you know, I think we'll talk later about, uh, you know, who the council is and, and making sure, you know, I, I, you know, we're not a big agency like others. And so, um, you know, that visibility factor um, has certainly been uh, a, a challenge, but an opportunity. And an exciting opportunity for education. It's just been such a yeah. priority for this year's session. So definitely having those new faces to uh, to greet and to work with is is exciting. Well, let's go ahead and kick off our our questions for this update series. And Superintendent Critchfield, we'll begin with you. There were several pieces of legislation that you worked hard to get through this session. Tell us about your efforts around career technical education, the parental bill, the parental rights bill, and one that I thought was very interesting, the financial literacy bill. Uh, could you give us some background as to why you brought those forward and how they were uniquely crafted? Thank you. Uh, th those were the three uh, priority pieces of legislation that I personally uh, worked on with our legislative partners, and, and we, we worked hard and, and lobbied hard uh, to see those get to the finish line. I'll, I'll start in the order of, of how they, they went through the session, which uh, will begin with financial literacy. And well, I guess I, I should also note that the, the process of, of centering on these three pieces really was a result of the campaign efforts um, that I had combined with the experience that I've had at a local school district on the State Board of Education, listening to communities, to families, to, to educators, uh, to our workforce. What are those things that we need and that our students need to best prepare themselves and, and position themselves uh, to, to be ready to go into the workforce um, and ready to take the jobs that, that we're seeing in a growing state. So uh, I'll start with financial literacy. Um, when we talk about preparation and, and skill development, I can think of this as a primary place for our, our students that are exiting the public school system, whether it's through traditional or through our public charter system, we want our students to be able uh, to be able to understand what it's like to take charge of their financial life and, and to be um, in a good position that way. Understanding, I, I think as adults, we know that the, the skills that you use to balance a checkbook, uh, to figure out your health insurance benefits. What's a 401k? Um, how do I calculate loan on, a, on the interest on a car and, and so forth? That, that's different than many of the skills that we learn in calculus or in algebra. And, and there's a lot of why behind these things. I, I had an experience a couple of years ago where I was able to go and um, participate at a local um, junior high where they put together something that they called Reality Town. And this, this is a program, it's actually a national program that I would um, advocate um, any school uh, to, to take up. Essentially what it does, students show up and they're, they're given a, a, a passport of sort. They're, they're given a, a name and um, they're a certain age on there. They have a certain career. Some are married, some are not. It assigns children to you. Um, so you have this profile, this life profile. And then with the job that you have, then you are to go and um, come up with, with um, your go to, you go get a car. Um, you go uh, take out a, um, a loan for a home or an apartment. Um, you go get a service with the cell company and, and you do all of these sort of life things. What's the child care and your monthly expenses? And so you have to come up with a, with a monthly budget. And as I participated in this, what was so fascinating and, and really um, exciting to me, as I talked to the adults who were on the other side of, of helping these students, the students were, you know, they'd look at their their monthly income and they'd say, oh, twenty five hundred dollars a month. That's incredible. And they would go get the most expensive car and the best cell phone plan. And, you know, all of these things. Well, by the time they got to where they had to pay, you know, this you have to have a child care plan in this. They were going back to where they started at the car dealer spot table and saying, I can't afford this car. And, and I heard so much 
great feedback from parents after that happened that kids would go home and say to their parents, I had no idea what it cost to be an adult. Thank you. I'm, I'm you know, for, for a couple of days, the kids were less, um, I guess, uh, greedy or asking about, you know, certain things from their parents. And, and so I share that to say that that's the type of experience that, that we want our students to have. And, and so having it as a, a required class as set alone standards really calls out the importance of that. Um, and then touching on our, our parents' um, legislation that we came up with, again, th this was not a cut and paste of something another state has done. This was not uh, looking at, hey, th this is what other people are telling us. This really was an Idaho solution uh, to, to a lot of the feelings that we've had over the last couple of years that the parents have felt um, that there's been a gap or they're maybe not as engaged with their school district. And, and a word that that is in the, the legislation quite a bit is consent or notification. It really is making parents a part of the overall um, awareness of what's happening at the school. So if a school district has a, an MOU or some sort of a relationship, let's say with a local hospital that, that brings one of their mobile um, health units to the school district to talk about um, health care and, and good health habits for kids, that parents are aware that that's happening. Um, or if surveys are offered, that parents know what that survey is. Um, it, it, it really is intended to increase the communication. It puts parents back in that driver's seat. It doesn't limit a school district in being able to do any of the things that they're doing. It just requires them to communicate with the parent. I, I think that that's reasonable and appropriate. You know, we do a lot of communication with families. Um, we send home a, a note to say, we're gonna take your kindergartner to the pumpkin patch, or hey, it's crazy sock Friday. Uh, make sure your, your, you know, your child's ready for spirit week. It makes sense to me then that some of these, these more sensitive topics that we also say, hey, this is something that we offer and um, we hope that your child will, you know, and you will take advantage of it, but we want you to know, you know, what, what you can and can't do in there. And then finally, um, uh, although it's not least, it's a, it, to me, it's a very exciting opportunity with career technical education. This was um, a number one campaign uh, promise and area for me that we would expand what we're able to do in the state, particularly in rural Idaho. You know, a 10,000 square foot shop in rural Idaho is a game changer. But we have communities who cannot go and get any more money from their, their local tax base for a, variety, for a variety of reasons. And it doesn't mean that the community doesn't support education. The economics of that, of that town may, be, may not be able to support that. And we know that the federal government has a, a very prescriptive box that our districts have to meet in order to access a limited amount of federal funds. And we know that the pie for career technical education in K-12 is, is a small one. And so our, our smaller, more rural districts get prioritized out of, of that spending. And so this program that we are calling uh, Idaho Career Ready Students enables districts to come and present a plan. Here's a, a local or regional need that we're meeting. We want to get down into seventh and eighth grade. We want to get lower and we want to be more expansive and, and comprehensive in the opportunities for kids. And here's something that we believe is very specific to our region. And then we're able to grant that money immediately rather than what's the plan? We can get you money in about a year. It, it really puts our districts into the driver's seat. So. I know that that's a lot, but uh, we're ex I'm excited about it. I think it's a perfect companion, if not the, the, the uh, preparation as we get into the launch program. And I know Wendy will talk about that and perhaps Representative Blanksma. The best we can do with launch is to have our students be the most prepared, exposed to the programs that are available, give them access and put them in a position where they can make the very best decisions for their careers post high school. Definitely. And again, thank you for your efforts. So much advancement in the way of education, opportunities, special focus to things that are really in demand for our community. So thank you for listening as you were out on the campaign trail to put forward really meaningful, thoughtful proposals to help, you know, the citizens of the state. And I think with that, we'll we'll pivot a little bit to the other exciting area alongside CTE that was uh, the Idaho launch program this year. So Representative Blanksma worked as a diligent sponsor, along with many, many helping hands, uh, sponsor of the governor's flagship piece of legislation this session. 
uh, to expand that launch program. And so Director Seacrest, explain to us why you feel it's such an important piece of legislation. And then also, uh, if you could relate to us some of the obstacles and I'll say there haven't been few. <laughs> it's been something that, you know, has taken again a lot of helping hands to get to the point that it has, which any big meaningful change always does. So it if does. you could kind of walk us through that process and why it's so important that we have finally gotten to where we're at. Sure. So I'll just start off with kind of a high level overview of Idaho launch and um and then we can talk a little bit about the process. So um, launch is an existing program. We we started the program in November of 2020. Um, it was part in response to the pandemic, but we had the, the Workforce Development Council had been talking about the need for um, helping Idahoans who needed to connect to short-term workforce training where federal financial aid typically isn't available. And um, that was something that, uh, that we'd started envisioning what kind of a program, what could we put in place using the state's workforce development training fund um, to, to support that. Um, Idaho employers, you know, have been growing, growing, growing. Idaho was the first state to, re, um, to reach the um, employment levels post pandemic. So, you know, where we dipped in March, we were back up to the employment levels by October. Um, first state in the nation to, to reach that. And we've just continued to grow and grow and grow. But what hasn't happened is our labor force hasn't reconnected. Um, so our labor force participation rate is still lower than it was pre-pandemic. We are missing somewhere in the neighborhood of 25,000 people from the, the labor force that, uh, you know, if you did the ratios that, you know, that we would have had, um, had the pandemic not happened. And so the other thing is, is the pandemic just changed the skill set that individuals needed um, to, to continue to, you know, work in jobs that they were currently working in. You know, some jobs didn't come back and some people needed to, to completely shift careers. So we had an opportunity um, to uh, leverage some of the original CARES Act funding to start Idaho Launch. And, and so in the summer of 2020, um, August of 2020-ish, we, we did a survey of Idaho employers. We had about 845 employers respond to that, uh, that survey. And they told us what skills they were looking for in, in the workforce. Um, they overwhelmingly were hiring and had been hiring, um, you know, since the, the, the start of the pandemic. They, but they were needing different skill sets. And so we asked them what those skills were. And then we matched that up against the, um, the training programs that are available in not only our, our public um, institutions, but in private uh, training providers as well. Um, so we started in November, 2020, offering um, up to $5,000 for any Idahoan who wanted to access the short-term workforce training. And, uh, we, it, it, it's just gone, um, it's just had exponential growth. I, I mean, the program has been um, amazing. And um, the governor, you know, and, and uh, legislators recognizing that, you know, we need to do more to prepare our youth for careers. You know, when I talk about the labor force participation rate, when you start diving deep into the numbers, our youth aren't connecting to the workforce. Right. And, and, and labor force participation is looking at those who actually want to work, not those who are in college, in school, you know, doing something different. It's looking at the people who want to connect to work. And when we look at the labor force participation rate among our 18 to 24 year olds, it's much lower than the working age population. And and the unemployment rate for that group is much higher than the general population. So there's this disconnect. Something's happening. Um, on an average year, we've got 22,000 Idaho um, seniors graduate from high school. And, you know, if, if we use, again, pre-pandemic numbers, half of them were going on to post-secondary education. And, and we were doing, you know, so much in the state to try and figure out how to help more of them go on. But what were we doing about those who weren't going on? You know, why weren't they going on? What's the, the issue? And then when you look at, you know, data that's somewhat anecdotal in nature, but looking at, you know, the average age of an apprentice in Idaho or the average age of a technical college student, it's like 27. So what's happening between 17, 18 years old and 27? 
Where are these individuals? And, and could we do a better job of connecting them directly into opportunities? Maybe they don't feel like they're four-year college bound, right? Maybe that's just not something that they can take that step. But if we can say, you know, hey, here's an apprenticeship program, here's a commercial truck drivers, you know, program that you can go into and you can, you know, you can go into work and make a sustainable wage. And then if two, three, five years later, you're ready to go and um, take that traditional college route, then you, you have the income to support it. So launch, you know, this expansion of launch is really targeted at how do we how do we shorten that time frame of when our youth are disappearing, right? And, and not, you know, actively participating in, in the labor force. How do we give them additional options? How do we broaden what college means? Post-secondary, there's so many different post-secondary options and we need to s- celebrate all of them. And so launch kind of changes the dynamic and it says, you know, hey, we're going to support you. We're going to give you, you know, up to $8,500 towards any post-secondary option that you choose. Um, so the the original bill, um, you know, there's been lots of, uh, lots of iterations along the way, but the original bill, you know, said we're going to make available, you know, a minimum of $8,500 to graduating high school seniors that are, are going on and they can be going on to a traditional college program. They can be going on to workforce training. Um, we're going to let them decide what, what makes the most sense for them. And it's tied to in-demand careers, right? I mean, there's, you know, we're a small state. We're going to always have limited amounts of funding. And so we're going to prioritize it when we, when we have, you know, more students who, you know, want to leverage the launch program than, you know, what we have funding for, we're going to prioritize it towards in-demand careers. And the council takes a, you know, a very data-driven approach at looking at, you know, what's an in-demand career, you know, careers that, you know, generally have more than 150 openings a year in the state of Idaho, careers that have a positive growth rate and, you know, that need more than a high school diploma. And, you know, looking at that and, and saying there's all of these opportunities for you, Idaho Launch gives them the ability to to take that next step. So the original bill was introduced, passed the House, went over to the Senate, sat around for a little while. The Senate uh, worked on a, a trailer bill. There were some things that they wanted to, to change in there, and, and that's perfectly fine. Like I said earlier, I think, you know, the more people we have providing input to a process, we end up with a better product in the end. But the um, trailer bill is now sitting back in the House. Um, it's passed the Senate, sitting in the House, waiting to, to be voted on. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll see in the next, uh, possibly this afternoon, possibly uh, tomorrow, uh, where, where that ends up. But um, the trailer bill does a couple of key things. It, um, it actually takes the, um, the, the $8,500, it reduces it to 8,000 or 80% of tuition and fees for the program. So make sure that the students have some skin in the game that they're, you know, putting, you know, their own resources towards the the program. Um, It does, it it puts reporting um, requirements on the Workforce Development Council, which I assure you we would have already done. Um, We're very, very data-driven. We're always looking at, you know, what's what's giving us the best return on investment. Um, It puts a five-year sunset on the program, which is fine, right? Because we don't want to keep a program going if it's not working. However, I have a really strong hunch that it's going to work really well. So I'm not overly concerned about that. Um, you know, and it, it, it just, you know, it, it, it's all about improving, you know, the opportunities for our youth. So um, regardless of what happens in the next couple of days, the Workforce Development Council is super excited about implementing this program. Thank you so much. And the Boise Chamber was really excited to be the first chamber to come out fully supportive of that because we do recognize how critically important it is to fill that workforce gap that exists. And we're excited for the continued um, devotion to to doing so. So thank you. Uh, This is a question that I was going to have for Representative Blanksma, but maybe the two of you might be able to sort of fill in, but I think it's an important one because educational choice has been something that's been uh, discussed heavily at the State House this year. And so 
from your perspective, how have those proposals to create educational savings accounts or uh, more school choice sort of impacted both the launch program, but also taken some of the narrative about um, you know how we how we address educational opportunities in the state. How has that impacted this session from your perspective, or how has it impacted the the path forward for launch? And uh, I'll I'll start with you, Debbie, because Wendy, you just <laughs> you just gave us a long winded answer, which we appreciate. <laughs> Uh, you know, I think the school choice issue um, has been um, a primary issue this session, uh, particularly in education. Uh, we saw a number of competing bills uh, to to try to address it in a variety of ways. And I, I think um, that the the fact that there wasn't one that, that made it to the finish line shows that we haven't found that Idaho solution yet on this issue. And I also choose to believe that many of our legislators recognize that in Idaho, we have a lot of choice. And, and how are we defining that? I, I hate to see a national narrative come into Idaho and say, Idaho, you don't have any choices and that it all is tied up in uh, taxpayer money going to private tuition. Aside from that, uh, we have more choice than most states. In fact, we were ranked nationally by the Heritage Foundation, which is a conservative group, um, as being third in the nation for educational freedom. And so um, I saw a number of ways that, that we're enhancing that this session. Uh, we saw an, an, an open enrollment bill um, that's making its way or has made its way through the legislature, which will give parents more flexibility within their own school district and neighboring districts to, to make those choices. Uh, we continue to see uh, more legislation uh, to provide more opportunities within our public charter system. And, and we, are, we, we saw the governor's recommendation to make empowering parents an ongoing program, which does give taxpayer dollars to our families and it allows them to make whatever decision you know that they they want to make to supplement uh, the, the gaps that they see. And, and so I, I think when we first stop and, and think about the choices that we have in Idaho, and we look at, you know, I, I don't know, I think we we're close to about five. At one point, I think we had about five pieces of legislation kind of circulating at the same time. Uh, and, and knowing that we didn't quite get there on, on some of these, I anticipate it coming back. Um, I'm going to chair the uh, parent advisory panel that is a part, the statutory part of empowering parents this summer. In fact, we're encouraging parents to apply to be on the panel and, and come and have a say. On, on how we want to proceed with these programs. There's been a lot of discussion. We've heard from policymakers, legislators, lobbyists, outside national groups, but we haven't heard too much from our parents. And so we'll have an opportunity this summer uh, to, to have a full conversation that will provide recommendations on, on what we wanna do in this arena. In the meantime, we'll continue uh, as a department, um, as a department of education, as a superintendent. I'm the strongest advocate about parental choice and how does that fit within our public system and within our constitutional responsibilities? From Director Seacrest, from your vantage point, how has the the drive for that sort of impacted, um, I, I guess, just the path for launch? Because the two were sort of held out as it was an either or, right? And I don't, from my perspective, at least, you know, that wasn't the case. It was about advancing opportunities for all parents and kids and folks entering the workforce. And so from, from your vantage point, uh, how did that impact your efforts? Well, I, I think you hit the nail on the head is that it just, you know, it, it, perhaps launch would have moved through a lot more quickly had um, all of the, the bills not um, been taken up. But I think, I mean, I think Debbie did a wonderful job of, of explaining, you know, Kind of what the process was and and you know it, it takes time so i don't know that i have uh any any more wise words to add to to that sarah uh director you and the governor did a lot of education around the state talking about what the workforce development council is what its function is could you speak a little bit to the the role that you see in the community but also the makeup Yep. Uh, I know accountability and tying metrics back were important parts of the discussion. And so if you could speak a little bit to 
to who the council is comprised of, that's a really critical thing from my perspective because we are talking about Idaho businesses that are invested in our community have been stakeholders in the discussion and supporters. And so if you could speak a little bit to that for our audience. You bet. So the, the Workforce Development Council um, is a, it, it's a 37 member um, body appointed by the governor. And our makeup, we have five elected officials. Debbie is, is one of the five. We have a, a, a senator, a representative. We've got a mayor and a county commissioner um, that are all representing um, their, their communities and, and, and the voters of Idaho. We've got eight government agency leaders. So the director of the Department of Labor, director of commerce. We have um, one of the deputy directors of health and welfare. Um, Russ Barron from the Division of Occupational and Professional Licensing, all of all of these, you know, different groups that are um, part of this workforce ecosystem in, in the state. Then there's 17 members who represent the private sector. Um, one of our responsibilities, we serve as the uh, state and local workforce board under the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. So there's some very specific uh, categories and percentages that we have to make with our our um, membership, and um, we have to be 51% private sector. Um, the you know they want to see this be an employer-led effort, um, and then we've got four positions that are um, union um, related to that are specifically representing registered apprenticeship programs, and then three community-based organizations: one that represents out-of-school youth, one that represents veterans, and one that represents um, people with disabilities. And so really a broad um, makeup and, and perspective of, of individuals that, you know, all are contributing to the, the work that we do with the council. And, you know, you mentioned earlier that, you know, the I was appointed by Governor Otter and what had happened in 2017 was, you know, Idaho's employers we're having challenges with the workforce system. It wasn't it wasn't meeting their needs. And, you know, Governor Otter appointed a task force um, that looked at it and said, you know, it, this is so broad across multiple agencies that it can't just reside within one entity. And so that's when the council was moved under the umbrella of the executive office of the governor and um, I was brought in. And so, you know, we are responsible for advising the governor, the legislature and the appropriate ex um, executive agencies on, you know, developing and implementing a comprehensive workforce development strategy for Idaho. And, and we kind of have these three big goals that we're responsible for. The first is increasing public awareness of and access to career education and training opportunities, because we can have all of the amazing, you know, programs, CTE programs in our high schools and post-secondary programs. And if nobody knows about them or they don't know why they should be pursuing these programs, we're not going to solve the, the, the challenges in the state. Our second goal is to improve the effectiveness, quality, and coordination of the programs and services designed to maintain a highly skilled workforce. So how do we, you know, how do we ensure that there's collaboration among the different programs that are all reaching towards the same goal, which is to help Idahoans access sustainable jobs? And then making sure that we're providing for the most efficient use of federal, state, and local workforce development resources. So, you know, we, we have limited dollars. Let's make sure that we're getting the best return on our on um, the investment. And, you know, some of the key things, the council, you know, accountability and transparency are two of the most important things to the council. So making sure that the work that we're doing, that we're, you know, we're getting feedback from, you know, all of the, the, the different um, partners in this work and that we're transparent and that we're, you know, looking at how are we, how are we doing you know, what do we need to be doing differently? So that's in a nutshell, the, you know, the, the, the scope of the council. And, um, you know, like I said, a very broad, um, diverse makeup, which is quite frankly, for me as the executive director, just a, it, it's wonderful. You know, I, most people are like, you have a 37 member board. Oh my goodness. I love it. I love it. I have 37 amazingly smart, dedicated individuals who all contribute in different ways and are actively engaged in the work that we're doing. Thank you so much. And that is really exciting. And this session has provided a really neat platform to discuss the extensive work that the Workforce Council has done and to learn 
or to to bring the awareness of the workforce cancel to to many more Idahoans this year. So that's been exciting, and it's it's been really neat to see you in action, uh, talking about you know what the what the ultimate goals of the council are and and how we're going to work to accomplish those. So thanks again. Well, I don't think that we are going to have Representative Blanksma with us. Unfortunately, it sounds like they are debating the property tax trailer, which is another uh, property tax relief, another main focus of this legislative session and a topic for a different legislative update series. So in the ab absence of having her, we'll, we'll pivot to a couple of other questions. Uh, Superintendent Critchfield, when you outlined your budget proposal to JFAC, you talked about how an increased career technical education budget would complement Idaho Launch. Uh, can you explain uh, from your perspective the importance of that relationship and uh, maybe a little more detail about the efforts in that space that you're working on? Sure, and, and I, I like to share real life and um, real school examples to really illustrate some of these points. And so I'll, I'll share just uh, three quick ones to kind of give you a, a sense of, of what this is like around the state. Uh, when I visited Rockland uh, School District, uh, just as a, a, as a way to understand Rockland, um, they are a K-12 school, uh, one, one building, about 150 students in, in the, their whole school. And um, as you might imagine in an agriculture uh, community, that their, uh, their ag programs, which are career technical programs, are some of their, um, their, the biggest classes that, that students want to take. And, and we want that. We, we want students to find a relevant experience in their, in their high school so that they understand that I'm coming to school to learn about something so that I can go do something that is um, exciting and you know a, a goal for me. And so when I visited with the ag teacher um, in, in Rockland, he explained to me how challenging it was to come up with projects for his students because everything has increased in price. And, and we know this when we show up at the gas station or when we go to the grocery store. Well, it's no different for our schools that are, are looking for uh, projects for students to, to use metal for welding, um, whether they're gonna have some sort of a greenhouse project. All of those things are exp expensive. And so, you know, he, he just shared as an instructor, I want to provide the best opportunities for my students, but with a very limited budget, I'm not entirely sure what projects we're going to be able to do um, and, and make available for our students this year. And, and, and so I share that as an example to say that these types of programs are more costly than a PE class or an English class. And, and we need added cost funding uh, to, to support these programs and, and not only to sustain them, but to grow them in the ways that, you know, that make sense. I'll also share with you um, in the Magic Valley area, I um, went to Twin Falls High School uh, last year-ish sometime and uh, asked the principal to take me to the class that was um, one of the electives that, that students really gravitated toward. And he says, well, then I'm going to need you take, to take you out to our shop. Uh, because welding, the beginning welding class is one of our most popular electives here. So I went out and I visited with the instructor there and and uh, we, we chatted briefly and, and he had limited space. And again, that limits the opportunities that, that students have. Welding equipment is very expensive. And he said, we're able to get about 80 students through uh, the program, this first year program every year. And I said, oh, that's incredible. He said, it is great, except that I turn away 100 students every year because we don't have the capacity, we don't have the instructors, there are other limiting factors um, that, that keep us. It's not a matter of are we attractive to students or not at this point, it is how do we satisfy uh, the attention um, that, that our students are paying. And, and I, it, what was interesting as a contrast was the very next day I happened to uh, be able to take a tour of the Chobani uh, factory. And, and for those that don't know, the, the Twin Falls site, it, that um, location, for Chobani is their global R&D uh, facility. All of their, their global R&D takes place right there in little old Twin Falls. And as I, I visited um, with the manager of the facility and we were going around looking at the various jobs and what they're trying to hire, he said, I spend a million dollars a year trying to recruit out-of-state talent to come here. And, he, and, and his, his point there was not that Idaho students are less capable, less intelligent, less willing, but we haven't connected them with enough of the opportunities starting in seventh grade and working their way up. And, you know, this is where Wendy and I hold up our pom poms and, you know, and, and, and cheer about the efforts that we're trying to do. And so he says, if you, you know, if you can 
create more of a pipeline for us so that our students can see that, you know, they can stay right here. And then the last example that, that I want to highlight um, takes place in the, in the north part of our state where 10% um, of our, our state's overall revenue comes from logging, timber, forestry. Those are some of the best jobs that are, that are available, not just in the north, but anywhere, frankly. And we have less attention in our high school programs because it is not something that the federal government says, hey, this fits a category or that fits into a box that our state has said, oh, these are all of these approved programs. And so with our Idaho Career Ready Students Program, we're going to be able to um, stand up at least 10 programs into 10 different high schools in, in North Idaho that will create forestry programs that will either put students right into a job when they graduate or put them as a um, transition right into the University of Idaho if they want to pursue a two or a four year degree there in forestry. Uh, we've got to get students back into the mills. We need students that can operate equipment. And, you know, when we think about these types of jobs, a very important part to me is how we talk about them, the counseling and the advising. When we talk about the dairy industry, we're not talking about students that are out there literally milking a cow. These are highly technical jobs um, that our students need uh, to, to be aware of. And when we talk about forestry and timber, it, it's not, you know, the, the stereotype that we have of a man in a plaid shirt out there with an ax. Uh, you know, th these are, um, there's all sorts of jobs related to these industries. Now, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we have many students who, who want a very traditional pathway to a, a college degree. We're, we're good at that. We're, we've gotten good at being able to help students to get there. We want to get as good at everything else as we do at the academic pathways. I think that that's a really important distinction. And again, a really exciting development as we as we advance education in the state. And I think it's so important that we have this collaborative approach with experts like yourselves, along with the commitment of the legislature and the executive branch to make these things happen in a meaningful way. So a really, really exciting time for our state. Uh, one last question I'll kick to Director Seacrest. I wanna come back to you before we sort of close out this, this discussion, allow for any closing comments that you might have. Uh, now that we we know that launch has gotten through the process, what is the next step for the Workforce Development Council in implementing that? And what do you want to make aware to Idahoans on what opportunities might be available to them? What does that actual rollout look like? Um, what what can we expect as next steps now that we have some finality as that's made its way through the process? We're hopeful, obviously, for the trailer, but that doesn't you know, make it so it's impossible for the actual launch program to happen. And so uh, what are the next steps and what does that look like? Yeah, Sarah, so it, it, it's a it's a huge um, implementation. I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, be I, I'm not going to say this is just going to be a, a simple thing. We're going to turn on a light bulb and, uh, you know, magically have uh, uh, this program up and running. And so, you know, the, the fortunate thing is, is we've got this this next year to get the infrastructure in place to be able to, to manage the program. And so, you know, we're going to be doing things like procuring and, you know, getting staff on board and, and making sure the class of 2024 will be the first ones that will be eligible for the, the launch um, grants. And so we'll be spending time this year, um, you know, developing policies that we need to have in place. One of the key things and, and just you know, I mentioned earlier, you know, we can build all sorts of programs, but if nobody knows about them, nobody, you know, understands what the opportunities are, then we we, we aren't going to succeed um, in meeting our goals as a state. And so, you know, the council for the last couple of years has been investing heavily in the Next Steps Idaho website, which is um, the state board's um, college and career advising site. And um, we've been helping to, you know, broaden what opportunities are available within um, next steps, make sure that there's really good tools to explore careers, explore interests, to do some of what Debbie said, you know, okay, well, if you want to, you know, if, if you want this type of a lifestyle, what kind of income do you need to make? Or if you're going to choose to go to this institution, how much is that going to cost and how are you going to pay for it? And, and so these types of planning tools that, that we've been collectively working um, to build out in in next steps over the past couple of years are now all going to 
kind of come together, right? And, and we have this real opportunity because one of the things that the launch um, legislation does is it, it, it says that in order to be eligible for a launch grant, that the students have to have gone through a, a um, college and career you know, planning um, uh, path that we will be, you know, we're, we've got to develop the, the guidelines around what that looks like, but um, that, you know, we plan to have delivered through Next Steps Idaho. And so, you know, making sure that our, our kids, you know, have the opportunity. The last thing we want to do is, is hand over, you know, this grant, a scholarship, you know, to, and, and have somebody not use it wisely, right? So things that they can do in next steps to think about what their future, what their, what their next steps are, um, and then be able to invest those resources in the things that are going to make a difference in their future. Um, so there's some other tools and resources that we've been building out that will all connect into this. One is called Idaho Connect, and, and it's a platform for Idaho's employers to connect into Idaho's classrooms. It's a virtual platform. It allows teachers to, you know, say, I need a speaker that can talk about, you know, this type of chemistry, right? And and how it's relevant in the in the workforce. And then Idaho's employers, they can say, yeah, we can, you know, we can join just like we're we're doing on the, you know, on this session, we can join virtually and talk to that classroom and help make the the learning that they're doing relevant. Um, and also let them talk about the jobs that they have and the careers and, and get them, get these kids excited about the opportunities. Another thing that I'm really excited to work with with Debbie and her team on is um, the pathways between, you know, if you think about every student, every 7th through 12th grader in Idaho has available $4,125 through advanced opportunities and then $8,500 through Idaho Launch. Like, think about the magic we can make if we help them see those pathways because the kids that are on you know, they, they know they want to be a doctor. They know they want to be a computer, you know, a, a software pro developer or, or whatever, you know, in eighth grade or ninth grade, like we can help them see what they can do with their dual credits with, you know, industry certifications through the advanced opportunities programs so that that, you know, $4,125 is really over $12,000 invested in their futures. Um, and then the other thing that that really ties into all of this that the the um, council is working on is an effort called talent pipeline management, and and this is something that was developed by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation um, to help employers engage more with developing the workforce. And, and so, how do employers you know collaborate to identify what their needs are going to be? to translate the skills that they need into language that education can understand so that education can then react and to develop the types of programs that they're going to need. So that is, is where we're headed over the, the next uh, year, two years. Um, but, you know, launch is just a, an incredible opportunity for all Idahoans. Um, and we're still going to have the version of launch where adults can access it. So, um, you know, this next year, I, I mean, we, we still have funding available this year, but IdahoLaunch.com, go to IdahoLaunch.com. You can access, uh, you know, dollars to, to support uh, the, the training programs, and we're going to continue to do that in the future. Well, again, so exciting. And for those who are listening but can't see, there have been so many comments coming in as supportive of the, the focus on CTE and just, again, such an exciting time for Idahoans to be able to be involved in this process as it moves forward. I want to give an opportunity for I, for each of you to, to give some closing comments. Again, thank you so much for being with us today, for your tenacity and your passion, particularly in the waning days of a difficult legislative session to get these critically important things across the finish line to the benefit of all of those in our communities. But with that, uh, Superintendent Critchfield, if you'd like to, to say anything else or talk about what you envision working on over the summer in advance of next legislative session, 
anything else uh, before we close today and then I'll and then I'll do the same for Director Seacrest. I just want to say thank you and that I, I am excited to be a part of education right now. There's a lot of good work to be done yet. And we've got great partners. You've heard from Wendy. There's there's others that are excited about this. Our districts are excited. And we, we hear a lot of um, negative at times. And, and it can be easy to focus on on places where we have gaps. Uh, but there there's a lot of great things yet ahead. And, and I'm excited to be at the front of the line. Yeah, I'll just jump in, Sarah, and say that, you know, I've worked in economic and workforce development since 1998, um, and I have never seen a time where employers in education have been more willing to collaborate and work together. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's about helping Idahoans, right? Because if we help Idahoans, if we help our youth connect to careers, then it it lifts our economy, it it helps our employers be successful, you know, so everything we can do to help our youth, our adults that are transitioning. And, you know, it, it's just, it's just so important. Work is, is really important in people's lives and being able to, you know, make good decisions about what they want to do, but then also be able to access the, the, the training and, and our economy. I mean, life has changed you know you don't it's lifelong learning you don't just get to you know go learn a skill and then that's it for the rest of your life it, it, you know it, the the pace of change has intensified over the past uh, couple of decades and so you know these types of programs i mean i'm just i i, I just feel very very fortunate to be able to work with Idaho's employers and Debbie and others in government and, and our, you know, community organizations to be able to make these things happen. Well, thank you for your diligence and hard work. It absolutely would not be possible without you, without the support of the business community and everybody else involved. So again, thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedules to be here with us today. Thank you to all those tuned in. Thank, for, thank you to our sponsor Optum and for our streaming partners. Uh, with that, thank you, and we will see you for our next legislative update series.